Um, so, so what we're going to do is we, um, I think this is the first lecture of, of my first lecture of the year. I'm not sure where we are in the cycle, but um, I've changed the whole syllabus and I just think it's going to be easier just to look at individual nerves. So we do medial nerve, radial nerve, ulnar nerve, look at the anatomy of the nerve, the examination of the nerve, uh, nerve entrapments of that particular nerve and then uh, tendon transfers. And then we sort of just do it more systematically like that rather than just do all the nerves, all the tendon transfers, all the um, entrapments in one in one go. So let's see how this goes. Um, so um, anatomy of the median nerve. Um, I think you guys know, or you should know that the median nerve is by far the most important nerve, um, you know, when it comes to the hand, without a doubt. Um, and uh, obviously from a philosophical point of view, you could argue that it's one of the most important nerves in the body because we, we are all about our hands. And if you just look at the net, the um, uh, sort of paleontolo paleontology uh, evolution of, uh, of, of, of hominids, um, you can see as, as, our, as we become more modern, our brain size relative to our body size. And uh, as you can see the bottom on the uh, bottom axis, the percentage of the racing energy allocated to the brain is enormous. And what is the brain for and, and, and what's led the development of such a monster brain that we've got has been the fact that we went from being uh, arboreal and, and quadrupedal to, uh, to bipedal, freeing up our hands and then using our hands to engage our environment uh, for tool making, communication, language. And it's the use of our hand that developed our brain and obviously our powerful brain allows us to do stuff with our hands that no other creatures can do in terms of building and, and uh, and playing musical instruments, etc. So um, there's the homunculus, the cortical representation, and um, you know a humongous chunk of that um, is dedicated to the median nerve. So the median nerve is obviously a critically important nerve, and there's just a picture of an average registrar, um, and uh, you can see how massive the hands are, um, and uh, also the massive lips, so lots of talking. Uh, while doing. Um, okay, um, so this is just a very quick overview of the brachial plexus and it just shows you where the fibers are coming into to power the median nerve. Um, but it, it, if I remember correctly, this sort of covers the whole of the brachial plexus, which will run through the other nerves quite quickly, but really just focus on the median nerve for the moment. So as you know, five ventral rami, three trunks, um, the three anterior and three posterior divisions, uh, then go into three cords and the five peripheral nerves, uh, terminal branches. Um, so the spinal accessory um, uh, powers the trapezius and that's the only uh, non uh, brachial plexus nerve and muscle that, um, that helps power the arm function. Um, so if you look at C5 and C6, they come out together to form the upper trunk, immediately gives off the suprascapular nerve, uh, and then, and then uh, goes down, those fibers then head down the lateral cord and then go down into the uh, lateral limb of the median nerve and then into the uh, muscular cutaneous nerve. So these are the C5 and C6 fibers that are that going on the lateral limb of the median nerve. And in, in this branch here, which I think comes up again just now, is the median nerve sensation. So the sensation to the tip of the thumb and the index and a bit of the, the middle finger, but the C5, C6, the median nerve sensation. Um, and that, uh, that comes down uh, in, the, in the lateral limb of the median nerve, um, as well as pronated teres, as well as uh, uh, FCR. Those are the major uh, muscles that come down in this little portion here. But mostly this is, the most important aspect of this is the sensation. And remember, obviously, it continues, uh, it splits into the posterior division just for completeness sake and then continues down posterior cord and then hit, mostly hit those fibers head down the uh, axillary nerve. Uh, very little goes down the radial nerve tree. So there's C5 and C6 uh, powers the suprascapular nerve, the muscular cutaneous nerve, and the lateral limb of the median nerve, which is C5, C6 fibers, sensation to the thumb and the index finger, as well as pronation or pronator teres, and FCR. Okay, um, and the other fibers, the posterior fibers. Then C7 also continues in, uh, um, to, to form the middle trunk, 
and then the anterior division of the middle trunk here joins the anterior division of the upper trunk to form the lateral cord. And those same fibers then head down the lateral limb of the median nerve into the median nerve. And the C7 input is really the FCR uh, and a little bit of sensation to the, uh, to the middle finger. Okay, and then there's, uh, there's obviously a, a posterior component that heads down the radial nerve as well. So that's FCR and, um, and uh, a sensation to the middle finger from the, through the median nerve, triceps and wrist extension, finger extension uh, from C7 but down the radial nerve. And then C8 and T1 come together to form the uh, lower trunk over here, the lower trunk. That also splits into an anterior and posterior division. The posterior division heads off there to join the other three, two posterior divisions to form the posterior cord. And then the, um, the, the rest continues on its own to form the, um, uh, the lateral cord, sorry, the medial cord. And the medial cord then gives off the, becomes the ulnar nerve, but gives off the medial limb of the median nerve. And there's a lot of important stuff in this medial limb of the median nerve. And then the, the lateral limb of the median nerve, the medial limb of the median nerve form the median nerve. And that's the M that we talk about when we dissect the plexus. Remember the arteries running in this gap over here behind this, behind this uh, lateral limb of the median nerve on top of the posterior cord. Um, the subclavian uh, uh, and auxiliary arteries. Um, so there you have it. Um, for, from C8 and T1 uh, down to the median nerve, it's the FDSs, the FDPs, and all the, uh, the thena intrinsics, the median nerve intrinsics, which we'll get onto in a second. So to summarize the median nerve, um, that's the sensation of the median nerve there. Um, uh, and I think you'll know that that's all the nerve and then the radial nerve on the dorsal radial aspect of the hand and the median nerve surprise pronation, so pronated teres, pronated quadratus, FCR, pulvaris longus, FD, all the FDSs, FDP index and middle, FPL and the intrinsic muscles mostly on the thena side, LOAF, that's lumbricals, the two lumbricals to the FDPs, index and middle, the opponent's pollicis, the abductor pollicis brevis, and the and half of the flexor pollicis brevis. But an important half of the flexor pollicis brevis is important uh, uh, innovation. Um, what was I going to say about that? I was going to say something. Uh, quite, oh. So just to remember that in the forearm, this is pretty much all the muscles. The, the, the ulnar nerve supplies only three muscles in the forearm. That's the other two FTPs and the FCU. Almost every muscle in the volar forearm is supplied by the median nerve. Obviously in the hand is the other around. Most of the muscles are supplied by the ulnar nerve. Okay, so what, where does the median nerve run? It runs um, after it's for, come out of the M up here in the upper part of the, uh, the lateral limb and the medial limb of the median nerve. It runs all the way down medial to biceps, anterior to the intermuscular septum. Those of you that have done hands, you know, when we, when we go and release the um, uh, ulnar nerve, it runs behind the intermuscular septum. Well, this runs in front of the intermuscular septum, uh, to running together with the brachial artery. And there, and this is an important area, it's important to understand this area here. So you can see, so this is the hand on this side, this is the, uh, um, the axilla up here. And the uh, nerve together with the brachial artery runs Firstly, underneath the lassitus. So there's biceps, biceps tendon, and the lassitus fibrosis, or the bicipital aponeurosis, lassitus fibrosis. And um, the nerve runs, uh, the nerve and artery run underneath the bicipital aponeurosis, and then they run, it runs underneath the pronated teres between the two heads of pronated teres. So remember, pronated teres has got two heads, a head that arises from the humerus, uh, the humeral head, superficial head and a deep head that arises from the ulna um, and then it goes through those two heads and then it goes and then it's finished with pronated teres and then it goes underneath F FDS between FDS and FDP. I think I'll show you that in a second. So this is just an, a, a more a better schematic picture. The median nerve runs together with the uh, 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 ulna, the uh, brachial artery underneath the lassitus fibrosis and then it goes um, between the two heads of pronated teres into this area here, which I think I've got a slide that shows a little bit better than that. So this is not actually a great slide, it's a bit confusing, but there goes the median nerve. 
together with the uh, uh, the brachial artery, which gives gives off the radial artery um, as it enters the cubital uh, fossa. But this is a, the pronated teres humeral head cut away. Here's the ul the uh, ulnar head of pronated teres, and there it runs between the two of those, and then immediately dives underneath the FDS, <laughs> and there's a very sharp uh, uh, fibrous edge to the FDS, and then it goes underneath the FDS uh, and lies on top of the FDP. I think this is a better picture. This shows it nicely, but you've got to use a little bit of imagination in this picture now. So there's the medial nerve. It runs directly over the medial uh, uh, condyle, underneath this humeral head, which should then just imagine continued here. So it runs underneath the humeral head, and there's the ulnar head of pronotaries. So if you wanted to expose it, you'd have to you'd have to incise the humeral head of, of pronated teres or the, uh, the superficial head of pronated teres. Then it's done with pronated teres and it runs underneath the FDS. And this is the, the sharp uh, uh, edge of FDS, which is uh, sometimes uh, uh, suspected of being a, a cause of an, a medial nerve entrapment. So the sharp edge, and then it goes under the FDS and the FDS has been cut away here and there's the medial nerve lying on, underneath the FDS on top of the FTPs. And when you do hands, you'll spend a fair amount of time in this zone. And it can be tricky to find the FDS, but the best thing to do is to come in from the ulnar side, from this side, and then get into that plane between the FDS uh, and FTP, and then you can find the ulnar nerve. If you try to come in from this side, you've got the pronator in your way, and you've got the FDS, which has got a very uh, strong fascial uh, uh, sleeve and you've got FCR overlying this area so it's a lot easier to come in from the ulnar side but sometimes you have to come in from the radial side. Um, note that it, um, at this level here it gives off the anterior interosseous nerve which lies on the interosseous membrane going all the way down to pronator quadratus as well as the FPL as well as the FDP to the index finger which is often it's not drawn here but this FDP to the index finger is often a completely separate muscle belly and tendon. These three are often one tendon almost and one muscle belly almost. Um, we'll talk about that a bit later. Um, so just a couple of uh, uh, points here. The medial nerve in the cubital fossa lies deep to the bicipital aponeurosis. It leaves the fossa in front of the medial epicondyle. It leaves the fossa between the two heads of the pronator teres. It descends between the FDS and the FDP and then passes to the palm deep through the carpal tunnel, lateral to the tendon, tendon of flexor detron uh, uh, FDS, and deep to the tendon of palmaris. Oop. Okay, so where can the medial nerve get entrapped? Well, a very uncommon, I've actually never seen one. Uh, I've seen this uh, uh, process on the x-ray. It's called the supracondylar process, uh, and it's, it's, it's reported to occur in 1% of, of, uh, of patients, but if you think about how many elbows you've seen, you've seen more than 100 elbow x-rays, and you don't see that 1% of the time. It's a, vestigial, it's a vestigial structure, and there can be a ligament associated with that, and the medial nerve runs underneath that ligament. It's a bit like the uh, running underneath the um, medial epicondyle uh, for, the, for the ulnar nerves. So it runs underneath this process. It's called the ligament of struthers. Remember on the other side, the ulnar nerve, when it goes through the interosseous, uh, the uh, intermuscular septum, it runs through also an arcade, a, a uh, half a ring as it dives through, and that is called the arcade of struthers. This is this ligament of struthers. Never seen it myself. I've seen the supracondylar process, but I've never seen this one. So that's, you, you should look, they say you should look for that, but I've never seen it. Um, then it dives underneath the, between the two heads of pronator, underneath the edge of FDS. So there's a big question where the pronator syndrome really exists. Um, as you can see from this drawing here, they have more proximal forearm volar pain. Um, and if they are going to get uh, paresthesia, it's after activity such as uh, pronating and supinating forcefully, like screwdriving, etc. And what happens is that they because the palm cutaneous nerve is involved, they, they get involvement of the palm as well, as opposed to just the fingers in carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, and this is the provocative maneuver. You, you resist, they must pronate against resistance. So you must resist their pronation. Um, and hopefully that puts pressure on the, 
uh, median nerve, and then they get uh, symptoms and pins and needles of the hand. Um, but yeah, I've often looked for it. I've never been sure. And um, the person I saw do this operation the most was the the, the previous uh, senior consultant here, before, well, almost before my time, Rob Boom. And he used to do quite a lot of pronator syndrome release, but he always released the carpal tunnel at the same time. So difficult to say which was the offending. Uh, but if he felt that there was some proximal symptoms, he would just release the pronator. And it's not a difficult, it's, a, it's just, well, it's, a, it's a fairly big dissection. You have to come in uh, anterior, uh, find the median nerve, release the, um, um, uh, ligand, the bicipital aponeurosis, the uh, lassitus, and then go down and just release the uh, superficial head of pronator. Uh, and then go down and release the origin of FDS. That's probably the most important. So the question is, does it really exist? I'm not sure. Uh, if it does exist, it probably occurs in very well-muscled individuals. Um, they get a deep ache in the forearm. Uh, remember, it involves the palmar cutaneous nerve as well. And they don't get the typical night symptoms. It's more with usage and, and, uh, um, uh, and pronating and supinating. The site of compression, um, I don't think you can just go and release one. You have to go and explore the whole proximal medial nerve. Um, you've got to look on the x-ray for a supracondylar process and a ligament of struthers. But really, when it comes down to it, it's, um, it's basically these three. The bicipital aponeurosis, easy to release, very simple. The two heads of pronator teres, more difficult. And the origin of FDS, that sharp, uh, um, that sharp band, uh, the, the sharp band here that it runs under right over there. So it's important to release uh, uh, those three structures. Uh, it's not a difficult dissection, but it's just you got to, you got to know where you where you dissecting there. Okay, so the anterior interosseous nerve is considered an entrapment neuropathy, or it's, it's put under the, the, the um, blanket of the entrapment neuropathies because it's part of the median nerve. But most people would agree that it is uh, probably a viral illness. It's either viral on its own as a mononeuritis, or it's a, the, the end stage of a Parsonage Turner syndrome. So, Parsonage Turner syndrome is a um, uh, another name is brachial neuritis. It's not uncommon, actually. Um, quite a few colleagues I know have had this condition, uh, probably because they know to look out for it more than anything else. Um, and what happens is they get they can literally wake up in the middle of the night or early in the, in the morning and uh, go to bed fine and wake up the next day with severe parascapular or posterior shoulder pain. Um, often they've had a viral illness a couple of uh, a week or 10 days before and uh, they wake up with this, this severe burning pain. Eventually the pain settles and leaving some sort of sensory or motor sensory deficit. In this particular case, it's the AIN is a motor only. And um, the, the, the well-described thing is the inability to do the O sign because you need FPL and FTP to index. So if they can't do that, um, it's a very quick screening test for the uh, AIN. And it's one of those things that patients won't they won't come and say, I can't do that. They'll just they'll complain of clumsiness and inability to pick up for small objects. So if you don't look for it, it's easy to miss it. Um, you probably find the shoulder surgeons see this more than anything because it, uh, um, it pro often presents as an acute shoulder pain. And if it doesn't end up as ARN syndrome, it can end up in any terminal uh, neuropathy. And another classic one is weeing of the scapula. Often the long thoracic nerve suddenly just goes down afterwards. Okay, carpal tunnel, obviously the most uh, common and important entrapment neuropathy in the body, um, and it affects the, the um, uh, median nerve. Uh, the typical history, uh, most of the time you can make the diagnosis on the history, so that nocturnal waking, the patient will tell you they're absolutely fine, they go to bed, one o'clock, two o'clock, they wake up with this horrible burning pain, and the need to hang the arm over the side of the bed, or get out of bed and shake it out, run it under cold water, hot water, put it in the fridge, put it, it's amazing what patients will do to get rid of that discomfort. It tells you A, uh, how substantial it is, and B, um, you know, it's, it's a distressing symptom. Um, and really anything that gets any patient out of bed to shake their arms around or hang them out or uh, it's carpal tunnel until proved otherwise, okay. Um, they often complain of this clumsiness or tendency to drop objects uh, and it's probably due to the combination of the lack of the intrinsic muscles and the uh, and that fine sensation. So once again, 
carpal tunnel, you can make the diagnosis on the history. Almost don't even have to examine them. But if you do examine them, obviously you're just examining the median nerve. So it's a uh, uh, thena wasting and uh, the tunnel test, uh, the phalanx test, the APB strength, and the median nerve sensation, which is both light touch and pin brick. So that's looking for thena wasting. Uh, you're looking at it from the top and you're just looking at the normal convexity uh, either becomes flat or becomes uh, or becomes uh, uh, concave uh, as seen from the top because really looking you're looking at the APB which is the muscle immediately radial to the bone the, th the, the metacarpal bone the muscle immediately on its radial side is the APB which is the first muscle to assess and be assessed when you're looking at carpal tunnel syndrome the Tunnel test is by far the least sensitive, but the most specific. So there are very few things that will give you a positive tunnel over the median nerve with that radiation into the middle finger or the, or the, or the um, index finger, sometimes even the ring finger, but um, it's a very specific test, um, uh, but it's very um, poorly sensitive. In other words, patients with advanced and substantial carpal tunnel, it's amazing how very seldom they actually have a positive tunnel test, but when they do have it, that's carpal tunnel, done and dusted. The Phelan's test is the most sensitive, but the least specific. There's so many things that can cause pain when you do the Phelan's test. Um, and if you don't actually ask the patient specifically to, to comment on their symptoms, but when you do the Phelan's test, they'll, they'll always come back positive because patients don't like to be hyperflexed for that long. And they'll complain of pain in the hand, on the back of the hand, on the front of the hand, uh, in the fingers, but you've got to ask them whether they're getting pins and needles when you do the phalanx test. So very sensitive. Almost all patients with carpal tunnel have a positive phalanx test, but it doesn't mean it's carpal tunnel because many things cause a positive phalanx test. Um, this video is meant to play. It shows you how to test APB. So what you want to be doing is you want to ask your patient to hold the thumb up to the roof with, a, with the, the back of the hand flat on the table, and you can resist that and actually palpate in the, the muscle bulk and the muscle strength. So it's resisted abduction of the thumb up towards the roof. Not opposition, just abduction. Um, I never test for opposition. It's too difficult and it doesn't really tell you very much. Um, it's difficult to test opposition strength. Um, I'm, I'm, I maybe do it if, you know, if I'm looking for end stage uh, carpal tunnel, but mostly I don't test for opposition. It's really just APB. Um, and then medium nerve sensation thumb index and especially the middle uh, it's important to always test the little finger and go from the little to the middle little to the index little to the thumb always compared to the little finger because that should obviously be normal don't, don't even bother testing the ring finger because it's a split uh, a sensation in the ring finger so it's just little to thumb little to index and little to middle with the middle probably being the most important because it's it's a sensation that should be similar to the sensation of the little finger uh, what about special investigations? Uh, very seldom. Um, at the bottom line there, you can say if you suspect um, glucose or diabetes, you should test their random blood glucose. If you suspect thyroid, you can test their thyroid. But I don't go around testing every patient's glucose and thyroid because um, the yield on that will be pretty low. And most patients know they're diabetic and know they've got a thyroid issue. But if, if there's any doubt, then uh, I, would, I would test them. And then uh, if also if there's any doubt about gout, uh, sometimes we just see gout, as you can see this patient here, we open up the carpal tunnel and there was a roaring calcific uh, gouty deposits. Um, other nerve conduction, uh, other investigations, including nerve conduction studies, we only do those in our clinic if it's atypical. In other words, your patient just is adamant that the little finger's involved or they're adamant that it's there 24 seven, not only at night and they're adamant about really strange things and the examination is is uh, difficult to interpret and doesn't fit in with the clinical findings then rather just send them for nerve conduction studies because you're really covering your back and um, you know you've got some sort of ob relatively objective proof that they do or don't have carpal tunnel syndrome uh, but to send every patient for nerve conduction studies even in private is a massive monumental waste of time and money um, and uh, uh, as I say, if there's any medical legal issues or what we call secondary gainitis, they, they've slipped on the floor at pick and pay and now they say they've got post-traumatic carpal tunnel, 
rather just do a nerve condition studies just to cover yourself. Um, also, when I was doing a lot of WCA, I always used to do nerve condition studies because, you know, when they come back and they're still in pain, you can show that they had, nerve, they had a positive nerve conduction study and that's why you did the surgery. Um, what we use mostly, as those who have been through hands know, is what we call the injection test. So it's a, a partly therapeutic, as you'll see from the next slide, but mostly a diagnostic test. Um, and if you put the, the, the local anesthetic with the cortisone into the carpal tunnel, not into the nerve, you should get at least some temporary improvement, which is a strong predictor of A, carpal tunnel, and B, response to surgery. If they don't get better with injection, they're probably not going to get better with the surgery. They probably don't have carpal tunnel. Um, and this is this was written up in the um, uh, Plastic Surgical uh, Journal a couple of years back. And in essence, what it's saying is that if you look at um, if you look at a hundred patients on the first of January with carpal tunnel, then by the end of December, ninety of those patients will either be booked for carpal tunnel or would have had a carpal tunnel operation. So you're wasting your time with these repeated injections and repeated this and repeated that. Um, uh, ninety percent are going to need surgery. So this slide doesn't show, but this just shows you what happens when we inject them. Uh, about between 10 and 15, I forget, uh, this is comparing different other different studies, between 10 and 15% of patients will have a long, meaningful response to the cortisone, which is similar to the 10% that won't need surgery in the long term. But there's no proof that those are the same 10%. But about 70 to 75% of patients will have a very strongly positive response to the cortisone shot, uh, but it will wear off uh, uh, over time. So it makes sense to... When I, when I took over the hand unit, we used to inject all patients three times. Um, and we realized we were just wasting everybody's time. So now it's one injection, assess it one month. If they had a positive response to the injection, in other words, the symptoms disappeared, assuming the injection was placed correctly, um, and the symptoms disappeared but came back again, then we booked them for surgery. If the symptoms obviously disappear forever, well, that's fantastic. We never see them again. And... Um, and uh, if they had no response, then they get sent for a nerve conduction study. If, they, if you still think there's a chance it's uh, carpal tunnel, you send them for a nerve conduction study. This is how you inject them. Uh, there's FCR and pulmonaris longus. You go just on the ulnar side of pulmonaris longus, about five millimeters proximal to the wrist crease, aiming for the radial border of the ring finger. I'm not sure if that, yeah, that does show the radial border of the ring finger. And just stay ulnar to that line even, and uh, insert your needle You'll get a little pop as you go through the uh, flexor retinaculum or the flexor uh, forearm fascia. And then you shouldn't get any nerve sensation or tunnel feeling in the fingers, but they can get it in the, obviously in the wrist or the palm. And once you're sure that you haven't, you're not intraneural, then you can inject your one mole of celesta and one mole of lignica, and that's enough volume. Okay, once you've got uh, they need to go to surgery, then your two options are open or endoscopic. Um, don't really want to go into too much detail, but a lot of people ask me. The advantage of open is it's a direct view. You're seeing the nerve. You can then comment on the status of the nerve. Uh, you can also confirm your full release. Um, and as I say, observe the condition of the nerve. So if the patient doesn't get better after the surgery or takes a long time to get better, you can say, A, I fully released the nerve that's confirmed. Uh, and B, it was a very badly compressed nerve, so that's why it's taking so long. Whereas if you do it endoscopically, the whole idea of endoscopic is you des you, it's designed not to see the nerve at all. You only see the retinaculum. So you're never quite sure what the nerve looked like, and you're never quite sure if you fully released it. So, but given the same surgery in good hands, open versus endoscopic, the results are pretty much the same in the long term. But uh, endoscopic definitely has an earlier return to work. It's a, it's, it's, it's a smaller surgery and a, it's a good option for those um, slightly built females who need bilateral carpal tunnel and want to get back to work quickly. <clears throat> okay, what about um, tendon transfers? Um, okay, so like all tendon transfers, if your patient's got a high median palsy, then you need to look at what they've lost and what have they got to spare. And uh, uh, this slide is a little bit incomplete, but basically what they've lost, as I said earlier, they've lost all those forearm muscles, pronated teres, uh, which doesn't seem to be a major issue. 
They've lost their two uh, FTP index in the middle. They've lost the FTS, uh, all the FTSs. Uh, they've lost the FPL and they've lost the, the intrinsic muscles, the two lumbricals, the opponents, the abductor pollicis brevis and the flexor. Uh, what do they have to spare? They've got the, the ulnar nerve FTP little and ring and they've also got the um, uh, they've also got the uh, breaker radialis from the from the um, uh, radial nerve. So that's your typical uh, high ulnar nerve, high median nerve. It's the uh, pointing sign or the uh, uh, the pointing sign or the gun sign uh, or the papal Benedict sign. And why is that? It's because those two fingers can pull in uh, using the FTP little and ring. That's ulnar nerve. This one is part of the same muscle belly, so it pulls in either almost fully or substantially. This one is often a separate muscle belly, so uh, this FTP, so it doesn't pull in at all. Remember, none of the FDSs are working and the FPL is not working. So that's why they, when they try and make a fist, they do that. Obviously, they can fully extend, but when they try and make a fist, they get into that position. Okay. So what have they got to spare? They've got the breaker radialis, because now you need to give them thumb function and you need to get all the fingers to bend in. So it's easy to get all the fingers to bend in. You just buddy suture all the FTPs together. So that's buddy the FTPs. And now to get your thumb to flex, you've only got a radial nerve motors. So you use breaker radialis to the FPL. I think I've got a picture of that. Um, yeah, so there's breaker radialis to the FPL. You can see the transfer there. And then you do a side to side uh, tenorophy or suturing of the flexor tendons uh, so you, you pull you pull them asymmetrically until they slightly out of the normal cascade. The normal cascade is uh, index long a little shorter. You pull it until it's the opposite way and then just do a, a couple of figure of eight sutures through all the FTPs and let them gum up in that position. And then they can make a full fist and they've got good uh, uh, FPL function. Okay, so that's to restore the extra. So that's for high medium palsy. The, the injuries up here. They've lost the FPL and they've lost the FTP, those two FTPs. So you butter them, butter them together. Okay, and then I think it's the last slide, uh, second last slide. Um, what about the opposition uh, for when you've got a low, a low injury to the, to the medial nerve? Obviously, they've got their full long flexors, they've got their uh, FPL, everything's fine. The only thing they haven't got are the loaf muscles. The two lumbricals, irrelevant. Opponent's pollicis, important. Abductor, important. And the flexor pollicis brevis, that's dual innovative, the ulnar nerve, so it's not that important. Um, so what do you need to do is you need to give them opposition back, which also improves their abduction. So whenever you're talking about opposition, you need a motor, you need a pulley to change the direction because opposition is a strange action and you need an, an attachment. So you must always think about motor pulley attachment. And the motors we use, mostly 90% in our clinic is ERP. Around the world, the most common would be uh, the FTS. Uh, remember that these patients, it's a low median nerve palsy, so the FTS is working. Wouldn't be working if it was a high median nerve palsy, but it's a low median nerve palsy, so the FTS is working. In our patient population group, the most common reason for getting a low median nerve palsy is a knife or a panga or a glass and they almost always cut the FDS as well. So we very seldom find the FDS usable uh, and therefore we use the ERP which I'll show you a picture of. ADQ, abductor digiti minimi, uh, you take the whole muscle on its pedicle and put it into the thumb. It's really reserved for the congenital uh, absence of opposition, the congenital um, thumb dysplasia, and then the promoris longus is a bad muscle to use, and it's really used only as a almost historical transfer for patients with end-stage carpal tunnel. You're doing the carpal tunnel release, you, you, you elevate the promoris longus and, and fascia, and you put that into the thumb just to try and give them some function when they've got nothing. But we seldom see such bad carpal tunnel like we used to see in the old days. Okay, and then this is the picture of the ERP uh, uh, transfer. You can see the ERP being harvested through a multiple incision technique uh, taken around. So that's the motor, the pulley is the ulnar border of the, uh, of the hand and the insertion uh, is into the APB. 
Uh, and this is the FDS transfer where the motor is the FDS, usually from the ring finger. Uh, the pulley, uh, or the thing that helps to change direction is a, is a, 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 a loop of the FCU. Um, so then it can change direction to give full opposition. And the insertion is APB. Uh, but the more, the more you want to pronate the thumb, the more you have to go over the top. Uh, out, of, out of this, in this operation, the most difficult is the insertion. Uh, for both of these operations. So that's the uh, opposition transfer for the low um, um, palsy. So guys, that's basically it. Um, 14 minutes, uh, everything you need to know about the media nerve, but we're too afraid to ask. Uh, any questions? No questions? I'm going to count down from five, four, three, two, one. If there are no questions, I'm, I'm ending this. Good. Thanks, See you bro. guys in the week. Thank you.